So our scripture for today comes from Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house of Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What, I he what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more value than the many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of God for the people of God. So over the last few weeks, we've talked about what it means to answer the call that God has on our lives. We have focused on trying to discern what God is calling us to do. We've looked at taking those first steps into following that calling. We've been reminded that God does indeed have a calling on all of our lives. Those that accepted Christ have been given a calling from God. We've discussed that none of us is worthy, yet still called. You know, we often talk about those things, right? We discuss what some people might call our testimony with others. Things like, how did you come to know Jesus? What has he done in your life? What is he doing now? Those are areas that we discuss when we talk about our faith. And they are great things. They are things that we should talk about with others. They can be inspiring to others to help them come to know Jesus as well. And we can look back on those moments in our lives when we felt Jesus walking beside us. And we can use them as reminders that he is with us to boost our spirits when they are needed. They are truly good things. But we often fall short of telling the whole story of our lives. We stop at those big moments and we fail to discuss or even talk about what it means to grow as a disciple of Christ throughout our lives. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about what happens after we've accepted the call that God has put on our lives and what we need to be doing in order to ensure we are growing in our faith. Now, when you think about the ways that you've grown in your faith and into your calling, what comes to mind? Do you remember the Sunday school teacher that spent Sunday after Sunday trying to help you learn the basics of how to follow Jesus? Do you remember the times in your life where you were dedicated in studying the Word of God and putting it into practice in your life? Do you think about the time that you went on a mission trip in service of others and found that you were the one that was changed by the experience? Do you find yourself thinking of those low points in your life where Jesus pulled you out of the darkness and into the light? And you were so thankful that you never looked back. See, these are all things that we might point to in our lives that show the path of the disciple. The path of the disciple can really be boiled down to this. 
we are students or we are learners. We are trying to gain the knowledge that Jesus has for us and how we should be living our lives and how we should be treating others in this world. In our scripture for today, we are reminded that as students, we will fail sometimes. In verse 25 of the scripture, we are told that it is enough, it is enough for the students to be like the master. Oh, the comfort I take from that. Because we are told that the student can never be above the master, we are only to strive to be like him. And maybe we need reminded of that sometimes. Now, I can't say to you that I've ever seen it in either one of the churches that I serve, but I have seen it in some people that I've come across in my life. People that have forgotten that they are the students of Jesus and not above him. Sometimes I come across people and, and they seem to believe that they've ascended above all others and they are now perfect and infallible in their lives. We might think of someone living in their ivory tower, right? And looking down upon everyone else. Well, the truth is, I don't get angry when I meet someone like that so much as I feel sorry for them. And I know that seems kind of odd, right? That I would say I feel sorry for them. See, we don't really like it when people are arrogant in their own abilities, right? We like people when they are humble. And if we're looking spiritually and scripturally, we'll find countless examples of Jesus telling us to be humble as he was humble. And we see countless examples in scripture of people that believed they were above everyone else, including God. And we see how that often leads to their downfall. So when I say I feel sorry for those people, it might sound odd because we usually take the approach with them of, well, when they do fall, they got what they deserved. But I feel sorry for them because I have learned so much more from my mistakes in life than I ever learned from my triumphs. I've learned so much more about how I should be following Jesus because of the times that I failed to follow him. Now, if you have never made a mistake, as these people might feel about themselves, how can they be growing in their faith? Well, I think that they can't. I think most likely their faith has become stagnant. After all, if you are perfect, why would you change anything? I think we all need to remember that when it comes to following Jesus, we are striving to be like him. A goal that we can never obtain. But what we learn and the peace that we have in our hearts comes from our attempts and the ways that we grow in our faith when we try. Now, also in our scripture for today, I think there is a part that is overlooked in this passage. There is so much packed into these uh, 15 some odd verses, right? So many lessons that we could have from them. But there's something that I think we, we often overlooked. We often overlook when we talk about it. And if I think if we look at it and take it to heart, it's going to help us grow in our discipleship. So in verse 27, we are told this, What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What you have whis here whispered, proclaim from the housetops or the rooftops. Now, even when we do study that, we focus on this part of the verse. What is it that we focus on? Well, we tend to focus on tell it in the light and proclaim it from the rooftops. That part, right? <clears throat> I spent a lot of my time as a pastor writing sermons, trying to encourage you to go boldly and proclaim your faith. And I do think that that is a very important thing. I think it's a big part of what I should be doing from the pulpit. But today I want to focus on the first part of each of those thoughts. The first being what Jesus tells you in the dark and what you hear whispered to you. It seems a bit strange to think of those uh, in those terms, when we consider Jesus, right? He is the light, not the dark. He is the roaring lion, not the whisper. Well, in this case, I think he's trying to tell us this. There are moments in our lives 
Well, we need to be allowing ourselves to connect with him in quiet moments. You might be thinking to yourself, quiet moments? What is a quiet moment? I haven't had a quiet moment in 30 years, Pastor. I know, I feel that way sometimes too. But what I believe Jesus is trying to get across to us is that we need to take time to be in prayer. We need to take time to really listen to him when we are in prayer. So when you are in prayer now, how do you pray? Often we find ourselves just listing off the things we need or want from God, right? If I'm being honest with you, this week I found myself in that mode a lot with Lily's surgery. Lord, please be with her and the doctors. Lord, please let the surgery be successful. Lord, please let her pain be manageable. Lord, please be with us while we wait and find out how things went. There was a lot of asking of God on my part this week. And sometimes life is like that. But I think we need to consider that we must be doing more than that when we pray. So when was the last time when you were praying you asked God to speak to you? When was the last time you said, Lord, tell me the direction you want me to go? And then stopped and listened. No other distractions, no outside things pushing you one way or the other. Just you and God and silence. You see, we've been focused on those moments asking for them. The moments where God speaks to us. We need to be focused on them so that we know what it is that we are supposed to be yelling from the rooftops. In a moment that I believe is from God, I found that our scripture for this week contains a verse that led to a big change in my own life. When I was first out of college, I moved to Spring Grove down by York to be a long-term substitute teacher. And it was the first time in my life when I had ever been living all on my own. And I thought, hey, I'm going to be fine. I grew up mostly as an only child. I don't mind being alone, actually. I kind of like being alone sometimes. But I was wrong. Within two weeks of being on in my little third floor apartment all by myself, I found that I was definitely in the darkness. And one night I called my parents and I was talking to my dad and telling him through my tears how I didn't think I could do it anymore. And I was bawling. I wanted to quit and I wanted to move back home. And as I talked to him and my mom, they encouraged me to find a church to attend while I was there. And I began to read my Bible each day, something that I had not done for most of the time, if all of the time, that I was in college. And I began my reading in Matthew, and it didn't take long for me to get to chapter 10, where we are today. And I read verse 29, and I was reminded of how much God loved me. A sparrow costs next to nothing, and yet God cares about it. He cares that it lives and dies. He cares about you so much that he knows the number of hairs on your head. So don't worry, because he cares about that sparrow. And know that you are much more valuable to him. See, something whispered to me in the darkness at a time in my life when I couldn't see the light. And those, those words turned the lights on for me again. And I praise God that they did. I am thankful to the members of that local church that I was able to get involved with. Thankful for the young adult Bible study that I was able to get involved with because it truly did make all the difference in my life during that time. So do you find yourself in the dark today? And are you talking when you should be listening? Well, brothers and sisters, let us commit ourselves to growing as disciples of Christ, listening for his whispers, taking his light into the darkness, and shouting his glory from the rooftops. Not that we, so that we can surpass our master, but so that we can do our best to live as he taught us. Let's do our best to turn the lights back on in our own hearts and in others. My challenge for you this week is this, 
I want you to read your Bible each day this week. Pray on what you read and really listen for what God wants to tell you. Amen.